Good day, Kate from the Nari team here. This past weekend looked a little different as Adam took the opportunity to interview three local leaders. A different one at each gathering, he dug into one question in particular. What's the value of bringing our vocational best to the same people in the same community over the long haul? Each of these interviews, a beloved long-term sole business owner, a retired and successful leader with Fish, Wildlife and Parks, and lastly, an extremely talented musician and artist, each of them have added tremendous value in their local communities as a conscious choice. So there's this question that we've been asking for several years now. We especially visit it every Vision Weekend, and it's this question, what if it's the daily that leads to the dream? And for us, we've embraced that question because it... It seems to capture some aspects of success and impact. It captures what it looks like to to really serve others in in ways that often isn't captured. For us, it it reminds us of things like diligence and perseverance, long-suffering. It reminds us that that the people that we most admire and our heroes, though we see them as savants, they're they're almost never savants. They're they're never prodigies. And this comes uh, despite the fact that we kind of love the prodigy story. Shane Claiborne points out that uh, one of the reasons that we like he thinks the prodigy story is because when, when we can convince ourselves someone else is a savant or a prodigy, then we absolve ourselves of any responsibility. He, he says when people used to say to him that he was a freak, uh, he took that as a compliment. But he realized, no, 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 in, in saying that, what they're saying is they have different DNA than I do, and therefore they can't possibly try to live the way that I'm living. And so for us, this question of what if the daily leads to the dream, it's a reminder that that vision is like 5% of the equation, that vision is cheap, that you don't even have to get out of bed to have an idea, but that real impact, uh, especially real impact in the context of local community, it it takes a a certain plodding, a, a grind, a commitment over the long haul. Uh, for, for me personally, I think uh, this lesson came first when I was, it was the first year in it existed, and there were a couple of guys who were longtime Helena residents, uh, very successful entrepreneurs in the like, truest sense of the word, they really were entrepreneurs, and, and they had kind of fallen in love with Jesus and local church for the first time in their lives, and that for me is the best part, is to see uh, people who, who they, they are on the receiving end of the vision you all have, and that is taking people and helping them to go like, wait a minute, what if we think a little bit different about Jesus? Maybe you've got him all wrong. That was their story. And they became these friends who wanted to encourage us and, and were very much in my ear just kind of going like, how can I help? How can I help? And, and one day they took me to lunch at uh, my favorite place in all of the world to have a meal. That is the windbag, which by the way, you only have another week before that goes away. So hope I didn't blow that story for you, but it's going away. Anyway, so we were sitting in the windbag. I could take you to the spot in the dining room. And again, it was, this, it was just these kind of working class, entrepreneurial kind of guys who were suddenly loving Jesus, loving Narrate, and asking me, like, how can we help? And then at one point, one of them leaned into me. And he said, Adam, he said, if I could tell you the number of, sto- the, the number of stories that I have, or I wish you knew the number of stories that I have of people and organizations and businesses who have come to Helena And and they came with this attitude of, we're going to kick butt. They had resources, they had vision, they had ideas. And then two years later, they left, having completely failed with their tail tucked between their legs. I wish we we could tell you all the stories, they said. And for me, that was that moment, because I I, I look back now and I can see what what, what they were asking me as this young 30-something ambitious leader who was surrounded by all these incredibly capable people who were very excited about this commissioning that we had received. I think what he was asking me is, Adam, do you understand how the daily factors into dreams? Like, Do you understand that you have to play into and through the ninth inning to really win? Do you understand that just because it's a good idea doesn't mean that it's successful? And in fact, I was talking to him again this morning. One of them um, went on to become a very good friend of mine. And he said, you know, Adam, the more I look back, here's a guy now in his mid-60s who's about ready to be done with his career going, I don't even think it was about the idea. I think it was about all those other factors. And so we're in this series right now called Add Value. And what we've been trying to do is explore... Uh, this, this idea that best I can tell in church history-wise, it, it was first really brought to the surface by John Wesley in England, where he started to go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Ministry is not just what happens underneath the ceiling of a church with the cross and the logo and a not-for-profit status. It was him that started to go, wait a minute, wait a minute. When you go to work, whatever your work is, if you go with a certain mindset, that's ministry, and it's not that we're trying to devalue this. Of course not. We, we believe passionately in this. But instead to go, wait a minute, what, what, if, 
What if you understood that whatever skills you have and whatever way, ways that you're currently employing them, what if those are God's opportunities for you to serve? And what if we went against culture and didn't do the like, uh, it's Monday thing, but went, wait a minute. Like, this is my chance to serve God by serving people, whether that's in a medical profession or in law or right now staying home with kids or in education, whatever that looks like. And so that we've just been trying to, I think more than anything, give dignity to, to the everyday organic reality and to remind ourselves that from day one around Narrate, what we said is, what if, what if we gathered on Sunday as a bunch of people who have busy lives and jobs and all this opportunity to serve God in the organic everyday world? And what if Sunday was this like, whew, I need a redose of vision. What if Sunday was this like deep breath? What if Sunday was this place where we share story and remind ourselves that this really isn't church or at least it's only one-seventh, but that those other six days are vital if we're really trying, if we're really living the life that we're trying to. So this morning, what I want to do, uh, w- one of the types of people that I've had the opportunity to get to know since being here that I didn't see this one coming was, was the person, and, and there's many of them, uh, many of you are them, who is doing great work. I mean like world-class work. I was talking to somebody this week who, who teaches in, in a certain uh, organization. I won't name the, the school, but they were in this spot and they were sharing how, how passionate they are about what they do. And then when they tell somebody what they do and they find out where they do it, there's a sense of like, oh, well, you must not be very good at it if you do it there. And their sense was like, no, no, no. And you could just see that there was this like offended nature to it. Like, wait a minute. No, like I am trying to be the best at it despite whatever that reputation may be. And so what I've really grown to love are those of you teachers and business leaders and parents and people who, like you're not on the cover of a magazine and in some sense you never will be and yet your commitment is so much to this space and these people despite the fact that you'll never be famous and yet nonetheless you're you're doing it on a world-class level. Uh, we interviewed Amy Barrett, who owns Lasso the Moon. She's obviously a private business owner. Uh, this morning, this gathering, we're, we're going to interview uh, Jim Darling, who, who is a public worker, worked for Fish, Wildlife, and Park for the last 21 and a half years, has worked in fisheries for 40 years. And then next service, uh, we're, we're going to talk to David Casey, a man who is a local professional musician in this community and has made a decision to stay here. So what we're going to have is an interaction with Jim. where We're just going to ask this question, what, what, what is the value and the benefit and the cost of just going, I'm just going to give my vocational best to these people in this place for a long, long time. So we help me invite Jim to the stage, please. I'm going to need a handicap. Thank you so there. much. <laughs> Thanks. You can have that one. So I, I could... I could gush about Jim for a long time uh, because there's not a person in my life who encourages me more. We keep the council on a very DL around here just because we just, I don't know why we do, but uh, Jim leads you uh, more than you know uh, because he gives me a steel spine. So thanks for that. So I'm very excited. When I asked him if he would do this, he said, yes, I'll do it. But if you would rather drive bamboo shoots underneath my fingernails, I'll I'll do that instead. (laughs) So... Jim, let's just start kind of right off the bat. So 40 years in fisheries, 21 and a half, 21 and a half years. 28 and a half. 28 and a half? Oh, wow. Well, just that's significant because yeah. that part I missed is longer than my career. <laughs> <laughs> well, so <laughs> recently retired. So there's less yeah. fish. There's, yeah. <laughs> Very recent. So. so let's just ask you this. Like, did you, did you make a conscious choice to go the long haul or did it just happen? First, let me apologize. Uh, I know he doesn't like the savant label, but he's the only one I know who can visualize a mind map up here and speak off the cuff. And my That's mind map today. goes into chalk dust when I get up here. So, um, anyway, uh, well, you know, I, I consciously chose the fisheries profession, but it wasn't a blinding light on the way to Damascus where instead of fisher of men, I became a mentor of fish or something like that. Nice. But. See what um, you did there. Wasn't that good? Yeah. That's pretty good. For, but anyway, uh, it was just a series of pretty much small choices that during my upbringing in the 1800s, and <laughs> may seem like it to those of you. This the average age out here is about less than half mine. So, but anyway, um, so I spent 
many of my summers at a friend's cabin in, on the upper Sacramento in extreme northern California. And, man, it was, it was idyllic. I got to go fish. I got to go float, just explore and things like that. Learned to really love being in the outdoors. And then I had an uncle that everybody wishes they had. His name was Uncle Bob uh, hmm. to me. Later learned he was a world-renowned herpetologist, which is reptiles and amphibians. But Uncle Bob and I would just go out and count tree rings and noose lizards with grass nooses and wow. just basically soak in the ecology of the world there. And so I, I was well on my track there. And then you, you go through school and you say, yeah, science, eh, social studies, uh, yeah, ecological, nah, medical. And then uh, hmm. finally when you get into work, for me it was research and eh, management. That's where I went. So there, you end up, huh. before you know it, in a profession that's your choice. So you so, grew up a hippie. I did. Yeah. Yeah. Child of the 60s. Nice. I actually had long hair then. Really? Wow. <laughs> So, okay, okay, so how have you seen, there's, there's so many things that I want to ask. You should come back next week. <laughs> um, how have Bamboo you seen, because now, now you're looking back on 40 years of vocational excellence. What, what has been, how has staying put proven beneficial? Well, for me, it sounds a little too humble or corny, but really it starts with the family. So the first benefit to me is I had three beautiful daughters that I got to raise in one place and had the, they got to experience relative security. You don't want to rip your kids if you don't have to out of, out of school. And then uh, gained some lifelong friends, both they did and then Andy and I did. And, uh, but I think another benefit in the workplace was you, you really gained the trust and the confidence of both your colleagues and your public because they understand you're in it for the long haul. You're hmm. not the flash in the pan that comes and tries to institute all of these things and then disappears. You're yeah. there to see it through as well. So so within the network of relationships, that was that was a big factor. That's golden. They're, they're people that it takes a while to learn to earn their trust, and once you do that, then hmm. that makes a lot of difference. You said something when we talked earlier in the week about, about the ladder. Right. We, we talk a little bit about in the Peter principle. Yeah, exactly. Well, and that's that's the big trade-off. You can't, and I noticed you used it in your intro, but you really can't judge anymore your success, your progress in terms of the traditional ladder because you're on the same rung and you stay there for quite a while. But hmm. I think you can still gain a lot of satisfaction from learning, improving, Increasing your competency where you're at and doing good things for the resource. A lot of that, that's what you got in, in it for. Hmm. Um, as time went on, I got more and more satisfaction out of helping others to do the same thing, um, whether it was shielding them from bureaucracy, which there, there is a little bit within state government, sure. um, <laughs> or maybe avoiding the political intrusion. And there's some of that even more in Helena than anywhere else I've lived. And uh, then the other thing you can do is provide information, equipment, money, encouragement so that they can succeed, they can get things done. So uh, for me, it became viewing it more as a quality of life decision. So you, you get do satisfying work in a place I enjoy hmm. with a great family. So It's fascinating that so Amy Barrett last time, that the last gathering, she made the same comment of she owns Lasso of the Moon and that she's had opportunity to take that to other communities and other into bigger markets. But she said the same thing, like the quality of life mm -hmm. was a big part. So that was conscious for you. Like there was, was. A, like, well, in there's a rung on that ladder that I'm not going to reach for. Exactly. Huh. Yeah. Well, and many of us Montanans realize that we call it the scenery tax here that huh. to live here, you're not going to make what you would at your same profession elsewhere, mm -hmm. but that's worth it. And, uh, if you you sh you had a pretty as far as like vocation, a pretty sincere shift that happened. Like I made fun of the hippies thing, but like you <laughs> you you went into the field for yeah. one reason and finished for another. We we talk a little it bit did. about that. Sure. Um, am I am I jumping questions on you? You did. I'm sorry, but that's all right. So so just you, as he you, said, he's got clean lines and I've got like chicken scratch, so I can't tell where I'm at. Yeah. 
Well, that's because you're more right brain and I'm highly left brain. Anyway, uh, really it began with a, I'd have to call it a worship of nature. I'm a child of the 60s, even the 50s, so I uh, came by it honestly. Um, then the biggest shift for me, and a lot of people can relate here, is in 1983 I accepted the Lord. And so it it shifted from a worship of nature to the worship of the creator of nature. And it became stewardship from that part on, which which really fit well with me that I could look at the wonders of nature and argue for intelligent design, not on the workplace. Don't get me wrong. I'm not an evangelist out there doing that, but I tried to live that way. And then look at this, so many things that, that are, we are surrounded with that are just evidence of his goodness and What I recognize most of all is that stewardship is serving others to accomplish something good, and I recognize I could serve him while still doing good work towards his creation. So that was a huge shift. So so a very, I mean, I just love that because that's everything we're trying to get into in this series is following Jesus doesn't mean you have to go work for a church, which that's not necessarily a bad thing either, but that you really redefined your sense of purpose within because 1983, how old were you? I was uh, 33. Wow. That's super cool. took me cool. a minute. That's, that's old math. <laughs> could you speak, and I think we got into this a little bit, but could, could you speak to what has been the cost of, of plotting? Well, talk? there's no doubt it slowed, if not stalled, the traditional ladder climbing. There's no way of getting around it. I mean, you're in one place for a long time. So... It's less money, less recognition. I'm comfortable with that. I've always been better at saving money than making money. That's such a good line. And not very many people could say that. So good job. (laughs) Well, thank my wife, too. Better at saving money. Are you German? Am I what? German. It's in there. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, uh, and I think uh, another part that was a little harder to accept, but... uh, had to work through it is less ability to influence decisions at a higher level Hmm. Um, you know you start as a fish tech and you you're having all the fun in the world squeezing fish and and uh, netting and shocking and doing things like that but then just to be clear you meant that literally having lots of fun squeezing fish oh you do (laughs) yeah that's awesome so uh less pay less say uh-huh. Then you move up to where you're analyzing the data. You're a biologist and you're out there in the field and you're, you're still doing that good stuff. But then you analyze the data, you write up the reports, and hopefully you're influencing the decisions. Then you're a manager, hmm. and a manager uh, gets to supervise others, help them do that. Um, he gets to influence those management decisions, particularly when I was out in the region in Billings for 21 years. You could help shape the fishing regulations, say what's planted where, that sort of thing. And then I moved up here and uh, found myself very close to the political flame. But the thing I liked was you could you could influence things statewide. You could help biologists with information and, and money and, and insights and that sort of thing you gain through your career and, and really uh, influence the whole thing. So... Um, Really, I've forgotten where I was going with that, but... Uh, it's the cost. I mean, you were saying that it... Oh, so the cost is that all during that time, there wasn't this, uh, you know, I didn't aspire to the fisheries chief and that sort of thing. And you, that's where you get in and you start scrumming with the politicians and doing all that sort of thing. But the nice part about uh, an introverted person is that they spend a little time looking inside their head to say, wait a minute, that's what I'm the worst at. Yeah. So... Instead of becoming an inescapable opportunity, you can you can do more good at a level where you're more competent. Because you could have had it. I mean, you were on you were on that trajectory. Well, I know you're not going to sit up, up here to and say like, oh, I could have been. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They lost out. Does it does it bug you? <laughs> 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 does, but and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I can't help but think then that you also had to uh, what one guy said throw cold water on, well, you, you don't get to know whether or not you could have hung with the big dogs. Right. That's right. And so that was a conscious decision. Like It was a conscious decision. And uh, thinking about how critical 
even those of us who understand that are to our upline and stuff, there's a benefit to that too. You become It's lonelier the higher yeah. you go. But that's exactly right. You always wonder. My dad even said that. He was a sales manager and so forth for a, a, a lumber mill. Mm-hmm. And he was being approached all the time. You should run your own business. You should run your own business. Uh, and I remember him saying at the end, he said, you know, I had some regret because I didn't realize all that people saw for me. But I, I had a good life and I enjoyed it the way it was. So. Huh. Wow. That, I mean, that that's gold because... To look in the mirror and know that you're making that decision, I think when you define success and progress as feedback from others, it's a challenge to know like that's part of what guys like myself and everyone out here is going to have to deal with if that's their path is you're going to have to look in the mirror and just sacrifice that you're never going to get to know that. Right. But then again, you get to watch folks that have realized all that and the cost was much greater in yeah. family, in, in fun, in joy of life in general. So. Yeah. Got to make those choices. Do you think time. he, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of off the script here, but how, how much was God a factor in that navigation? Had, had it not happened in 1983, do you think we'd be telling a different story? Um, I, I don't know that for sure, but I know the level of satisfaction would have been far different. I mean, it just took the pressure off. I was hmm. I stopped trying to fill my term of success or my vision of success with how far up the ladder I went, I filled it with him. Huh. Just like they talk about instead of making your partner become everything to you, you make him become most hmm. of that and then takes the pressure off the partner and they can be who they are. So same thing with hmm. work, you know, just hmm. take it in the bigger context hmm. and uh, I think I'll, you know, I'll take a little lesser role in this life for a wow. little more eternal reward. So now you're getting to feel why I say he's like the man behind the curtain, right? There's there's a lot there. Uh, so are there moments where you almost quit? Never the profession. Uh, sometimes the job. Um, yeah, sometimes Just, alarms went off. Yeah, um, that doesn't happen every week. But uh, I cert- there was a time, you know, something about Montanans, and I share this with you, is there's nothing they love more than their hunting and their fishing and their outdoor experience. And so when you are somebody who makes decisions within that context, then the passion can spill all over you. And hmm. there were times that was very stressful, especially when I uh, lived in Billings and was a fisheries manager making those fishing regulations and planting uh, yeah. decisions and. And there were, frankly, jobs within the federal ranks or elsewhere that would pay a lot more money for a lot less stress. You can kind of disappear in your cubicle when you're in a larger bureaucracy. And uh, it was taking a a toll on my health that I'm still paying for a little bit. Mm -hmm. But um, ultimately, when you'd look at the other jobs, you'd say, wait a minute, am I making a difference? Am I being fulfilled? Is it really the job or is it? my lack of dealing with the stress. And so often, for me, looking at other jobs, quitting and looking for, going for another job um, became more of a a means to reinforce that I was really where I was meant to be. And the other part about bringing God in your life, you think about it, but you pray about it, and you pray with your family about it, and you discuss it, and you get reinforced that way. Well, and you talked earlier in the week that for you, the reality of the offer of a promotion, you were very aware, like, that... You, you had to not allow the the compliment of the ask to shade you from making a good decision. You know, and before you make it too noble, uh, there were certain there were positions I looked at that were in the same town where I was uh-huh. that I that I did try for and and didn't get, and look back and say hallelujah, uh-huh. uh, it wasn't the job for yeah, me. That makes sense. So how do you stay creative? Because I think what a guy like me and probably what lots of people here are going is like, yeah, but man, that sounds boring. Well, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) Well, the first thing is it's a you're assuming an unassumable assumption to say I'm creative. I mean, I'm so left brained, I almost walk with a list. So uh, very analytical, much more that way. But that being said, um, I think problem solving at any level is creative. And planning, implementing projects, promoting good ideas, discerning others' strengths, helping them to succeed, 
And so all of those things take day-to-day creativity. And then you add to that, which I always try to say in a bigger context, because it isn't all it isn't all your work. And at the end of the day, mm. that might be your less fulfilling uh, area that, you, that you've concentrated on. But it's not confined to a vocation. You can yeah. invest in making your family happy. Yeah. You can do creative things, reading Dr. Seuss to your daughters here and, yeah. and making them happy. Uh, you can renovate a fixer-upper so that it's habitable for your family. Those yeah. are things, other areas of creativity. That was, so. that was something you said this week that was really challenging to me. Is he just looked at me and he said, I guess I don't understand why all your creativity has to be reserved for your vocation. Like, why can't you find some fulfillment in giving that to your family? Which, Well, or your avocation, cha- you yeah, know? It's challenging. There are a lot of people that, that come to me and say, oh, I want to squeeze fish for a living, and I say... <laughs> that just sounds so weird. <laughs> so what I would say to that is think about it. Maybe you want to make fish your avocation. Get out there in your waders and with your pole, and that's the joy you feel. And then uh-huh. go do something else in your vocation. So, um, yeah, I mean, life is the whole package. So how has 40 years changed your understanding of vocation then? I mean, is, that, is the avocation a big piece of that? It is. Vocation is um, doing worthwhile things both for for the world and for the Lord and and gaining gaining satisfaction for that, keeping perspective so that uh, you're not failing at everything else while you're succeeding at that one area. And um, uh, count the costs when you want to stray from that because you, you face a inescapable opportunity hmm. and uh, by the inescapable opportunity just so we're clear you mean like the promotion that just can't be said somebody's no to. somebody's tapping you on the back or kicking you in the butt and saying yeah this is your spot you need to be there yeah. stuff huh. like that so you you take the counsel of your close family and they're your best deal hmm. and you you pray hmm. and uh, when you've got that kind of backing then hopefully you make the best decisions hmm. Sadly, we've got a red 34 up there, which means we're over. Oh, okay. So what I want to say is thank you for being someone who uh, won by almost every measurement professionally, vocationally, (laughs) and yet you've got a brilliant marriage and some incredible daughters. And on behalf of everyone in the room, and especially us dads and husbands, and business leaders, thanks for being a model of setting your ego to the side a little bit and keeping everything in perspective. Thank you. You can take him to coffee. (laughs) Thank you. Good good news is he's retired, so you can take him to lunch. (laughs) <laughs> and he's very social, so he'd love to just fill up his calendar for months and months and months. Anyway, he's very social. Uh, so several years ago, I heard a study by a guy named Andy Crouch. Uh, you, you can Google him. He, he used to be the chaplain at Harvard, a very thoughtful guy. Uh, he, he went to the Harvard Library and began to research uh, how the phrase change the world showed up in publications, in, in, in the title of books. And what he found was from 2000 to 2008, when I heard him, it was in 2009. From 2000 to 2008, uh, the, the phrase change the world showed up in the title of a book 174 times. Uh, f- from, from 1991 to 2000, the, the phrase showed up in the title of a book 100 times. From 1900 uh, to 1989, the phrase showed up in the title of a book 74 times. Guess how many times the phrase change the world showed up from the Gutenberg press through 1899? If you said one, you went one too many. Zero. And it creates fascinating discussion about could it be that we've misunderstood our role within God's economy because we get really excited about changing the world, but changing a life and drilling down in a community on this little tiny corner in a little tiny place, that... It's kind of lost its luster to us. And so this morning, I guess it's a twofold deal. Some of you, I want to challenge. And listen, I'm not trying to turn this into a moral thing. I I get it. People are going to move, and I'm not trying to say that. I'm just trying to put a spotlight, we are, on a side of that that I think often goes uncelebrated. And frankly, for those of you who are doing world-class work, 
or you're working towards it, and you're never going to be on the cover of a magazine, and you're never going to be the bureau chief, and you're never going to get that recognition, my hope this morning is that there's this conversation sparked between you and God, and there's a bit of a, like, at a girl, and that a boy, as you just kind of continue to be faithful with the little speck that God has given you to manage. Let's pray. God, thanks for lives like Jim and Andy's and the opportunity that we have to be influenced by them. Thanks, Jesus, for the invitation that you give us to matter and the opportunity to keep that in perspective. We love you. Amen. If you would like to engage further with Narrate Church, you can find contact information online, www.narratechurch.org. We would love to hear from you.